that we, we should and can discuss. Uh, we should do it very sort of briefly and uh, succinctly in 15 minutes and or also then later on. <laughs> so, Thomas? Please. Yeah, I'll try to be very brief. Thank you. That was uh, really interesting examples. Uh, I, I, I have one more question. I, I'm not quite sure if I understood what these struggles were actually about or who fought with whom and for what reason. And, um, well, I'm asking because these struggles reminded me of, uh, well, struggles over precedence among uh, lower class people uh, in the German-speaking lands, more or less at the same time. There is a beautiful article of a, a GDR historian, Jan Peters, about <laughs> struggles over church pews in these territories. In what, what is a pew? Uh, Kirchenspiele. Yeah. Ah, Yeah, and well, his 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 argument is that uh, these uh, servants, especially in these East Albion territories where you have served them, Leibeigenschaft, actually reproduced the social order of uh, the, uh, 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 the landlords, the um, what is it, um, Grundherren or yeah, um, so because they took their seats uh, in the church bank of uh, the owner of, of the farm, etc. And I was wondering if that occurs also uh, in this circumstances. I imagine that these were those were private slaves, domestic slaves who belonged to an owner. And uh, well, the order at the fountain, what, what kind of order was it? Or was it more about, uh, well, ethnic groups, languages? Maybe you can add I don't know a it. little bit on, on this. Uh, question. We, we, there are no sources uh, okay. really give an answer to that. I try to indicate some of the possible reasons. I don't think that it is an Im Im imitation of the Portuguese or dominant order because I, I don't see any parallels. And I think because the people each other did not know each other. It's the people did not know each other. So it's really people who come from different Regions, backgrounds, whatever, cultural um, idea, also different religions. This is important. Or they were families of religion, but or it was a family of religions. So they were they had similarities. They were not as different as uh, the Christian religion and and theirs, but they were different. So I think the first, or it's not just me who thinks that this is the social anthropologist's work on which I rely. Um, they had somehow to organize themselves, just themselves, without, in the condition of slaves, without thinking too much about um, well, the context. And, um, well, this was especially uh, investigated in maroon societies where it was needed to, um, to, to, um, Or it was, did not make sense to copy the the, the Portuguese or Spanish um, uh, society, mm. um, but that's the the creolization process is much more to find common denominators, a common way of language understanding, religious ancestors, and so on to to merge things to help each other, even if it's not as in, at home because these links are broken, but doing new ones. Um, and that's, I mean, I, I said it was the, just pressure. They wanted to be quick. And if somebody was slow, they just this. Mm -hmm. The second was about this. I had m several um, quotations about it, or at least in the original, um, fights between nations, so mm -hmm. fights between ethnic mm -hmm. groups, um, and misinterpretation of fights. So the, those people who um, depicted it understood capoeira for this. But capoeira, it was different from today. Today, nobody will probably, nobody will uh, have a, 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 <laughs> a, a stab or something. So nevertheless, uh, capoeira was not a, a, as aggressive as a real fight. It was something in between. So it was, it was and it was with music. So this this was misinterpreted. So it was not um, this kind of fight. This, these are the three reasons 
I propose here for for the fights, mm -hmm. and I think it was a re um, re or a, a figuring out of rankings in their Afro American society. So in this new society, they built mm -hmm. not in the bigger picture with whites, but just um, in a, in the new society they were building up, which was fragile, which was always. Um, being destroyed and getting new people and so on. But that's, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. that they fought their, their own struggles there. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Thank you very much for this talk, um, which is really a um, vital point to our, to our conference, although you said the contrary, because you were moving more or less uh, late 18th century, if I understood right, and then 19th century. And if we stick to our definition of momentum of its own, it more or less reproduces structures by refining them, but not by pushing them aside. But what you described in a way, from slavery to citizenship, um, nation um, agency as a citizen, by your lawsuits and even before that, that is something new. Uh, that is something that... Um, and the term for me would be emerging because I very much liked uh, what you said that it was not most of the time not done intentionally. No slave wanted to become a citizen because citizenship as such is, a, is difficult to, I mean, that is a new thing in, in the 19th century. Not even the citizens of the 17th century would want to become citizens. Not uh, the slaves century. did not even want to become citizens in the sense of the 17th century. So, no, well, whatever you, I mean, so, so the unintentional part I very much like, and then that that maybe not only the slaves but also the slave owners have their agency in these. This is an interplay of different. Um, this is chaotic in a way, so to speak, because the emergence of something new, I think, it's difficult to trace back to some roots or something, but because it's so new. Uh, uh, if you consider a long perspective of, of that before. So I, <clears throat> you at the beginning said that the, 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 uh, you have difficulties to apply momentum of its own, and especially when it comes to hierarchical systems, but in the 19th century, that's precisely our thesis, that the problem is what, what is hierarchy, a state-based hierarchy in the 19th century. I don't, and, and then at 1810 or 1860 and 1850, I don't know. I don't know, especially not for, for Brazil. So my question was, would be, wouldn't it be fair to say that what you observe is more like emerging things, you apply to the term evolution, evolution is something that... Yeah. So emerging meaning, we don't know where it comes from, we see that this is a kind of boiling pot, so to speak, but we don't know what is the flame beneath it, if, if I may put it that way. Uh, and there is a lot of interaction going on between different uh, um, spheres of, of society, it's probably not the idea of the free man that makes the trick, it's not, you know, enlightenment, we, we, but, but what then? And why not leave it with, with a situation where, which is so chaotic that no participant, is that what you said, uh, nobody knew what will be the end of it in the late 19th century, so something new popped up, which is quite different from what we described for pre-modern times, when there is a certain rehearsal of the same structure, refining that structure creatively, but but leaving certain pillars um, untouched, so to speak, if I got my argument across. So the question is, uh, instead of applying the, the term momentum of its own for at least for the 19th century story you told us, uh, wouldn't it, would emergence, emergence not be the, the correct term? In terms of, well, unintentional thing which you cannot ich muss auf Deutsch sagen, zurückverfolgen zu dem davor sozusagen tracing tracing back to 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 what is what was there before like in the 16th century because you didn't talk about roots which I very much like I think I, I, what I, I tried in fact to trace it back that's um and it was not intentional. So these, I had these two conditions. I, I, I wanted to trace it back without saying they wanted to become or without the teleological. Um, I mean, it's hard to write history without teleological. Then you have to say uh, there was something strange, um, something chaotic, something. 
<laughs> and my idea was just to use the momentum of its own because they defined, uh, Knöbel gives this as a summary, um, the absurd thing. So nobody wants it. That's the escalation of, of violence. Nobody wants um, violence to escalate. Nevertheless, it happens with both or every member in this escalation participating in this escalation. So they all contribute to it and nobody wants it. And I tried to do the same narrative. Everybody's contributing to it. Nobody wants it. But at the end, we have this, um, this, this result of um, citizens becoming slaves. But then I doubt the whole thing. And that's why I also don't want to speak of something emerging because it's just discourse. So yes, a new discourse emerges, true, or develops somehow. I don't think, no, but the, I'm not sure if the social or the power relationships did change as much as we think or fundamentally because the yeah with the arrival of citizenship or yeah with um well um with the abolition of slavery and with the um uh, arrival of citizenship mm -hmm. both things so if we look at new at europe i also doubt a little bit that the transformation was as big and if we um, i'm working on i'm really looking here at slavery and one of the question of my habilitation, in fact, is what, well, it, for me, it's not modernity or the 19th century, but the main question is, what does the end of coloniality mean for the society, for people like, like the water carriers? I think um, it meant something, the discourse changed, they started with litigation and so on, yes, but even litigation is, of course, if, if you get free because you win a court suit or a, a lawsuit, this makes a difference, yes. But on a broader structure level, it's, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I would say we should not see it, we should see it more on the discursive level because that's what we, what we actually are able to look at. We're not really able, or that would be a very different work to see if the living conditions in the broad society for slaves um, changed as much. And if we look at um, contemporaneous <laughs> slavery, there are not only similarities, there are continuities between slavery and, and, and contemporaneous slavery or illegal slavery. Mm, um, I'm not the moderator, but... Yeah, so if that's, um, we have Sarah and uh, Valeria, I, I have you on my list, and it's actually a quarter to five, which means it would be our time to go on the coffee break. I think we can be a little lenient, um, but, and, 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 and overdraw this a few minutes, but would you be okay if I, I took your two questions? Yeah, of course. I'll try to agree. Um, I wondered why, um, when you talked about the fact that the lawsuits increased after 1850, why you, didn't, you did not mention the British a pressure and the abolition um, of the slave trade by the British, because I think this is a major fact here, uh, which is n nothing internal, um, but it comes from outside. Um, and it was like that a, a strategic move by the um, by the slaves that made it only possible um, that there are lawsuits, um, which would be a little bit, in my opinion, an argument against the momentum of its own. Um, because also in the Spanish Empire, of course, a lot of slave, enslaved people presented themselves before the court and it never led in any way to the abolition. What was much more important was their participation in the wars of independence, which had nothing to do, again, with the court cases. And so this was the common question. What do you think about this? So take notes. <laughs> Next question is coming up. Uh, I... I also, um, I had actually a very similar question about 1850, and then also, I'm sorry, I'm mostly familiar with Emilia Viotti da Costa's account of, of the end of slavery, and also the kind of after 1850, this uh, movement of enslaved people from, from the north to, to the southern provinces, that, that also creates extra pressure because there is a polarization um, and the, the modernization that is taking place. So. I just wanted you to maybe expand a little bit more. I found your account of the fountain so provocative. 
about why like this pressure in the in the public discourse around fountain is so important to contribute to the debunking of the 1871 proposition why not the market why is it the fountains that are the setting for this um, and also it's only Rio de Janeiro right or is this happening in other cities as well so um, there's a lot of questions there but thank you so much I learned a lot I actually almost overlook Omar thank you Any question yes uh, <clears throat> mine was uh, a comment and a question. Uh, the comment was about how, how different it was, you know, the process of abolition in Brazil, uh, of what it was in Venezuela, for, in, the, in the Grand Colombia, mm -hmm. which was a mostly a uh, commitment of Bolivar that he made to Petion. So you had the influence of Haiti, direct influence of Haiti, mm -hmm. in the legislation where, that didn't enable, you know, more than. But the countries at this point, Colombia, Ecuador, and Venezuela and, and Panama as well had to get this legislation on, on, on abolition. However, you know, eventually after Bolivar died, most of this legislation was reversed. So there was a process of re slavery mm -hmm. in some states. And, uh, and then that's the when the, the, this uh, admission legislation was used for, by former slaves to regain the freedom, especially when they fought in the independence war. So they used this legislation, this manumission course, to regain the freedom and there are many records of, of these uh, uh, legal battles. So my question is, in, in, the, in the case of Brazil, uh, was, the, was this legislation used by former slaves or by slaves to regain the freedom? Or um, it was also used by the slave, by, by the slave class, this, um, the planters. Uh, because in Venezuela it, it happens a lot. They use this legislation to to get rid of commitments with elderly slaves that can't not be able to work anymore, so they don't have to support them, you know, long-term illnesses and things like that. So they, it was a very tricky, mm -hmm. to, to, so to speak, uh, because at the end of the day they get a, 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 a refund from the state, from the government, and then get that they didn't... Uh, uh, get any um, long-term commitment for health benefits and things or elderly slaves that ended up, you know, in many cases, moving back to the cities and and, uh, and, and as, as the new urban core uh, and disenfranchised. So I was wondering how did it ha how did see this situation happen in Brazil as well? Okay. No, no, no challenge at all to answer all of these questions. <laughs> Um, the British first um, question, you're right. I, I, I talked, I said other historians give other reasons and that's, um, external influences. Yes, it's also pressure. Um, yes, this is the common narrative. In fact, that it is 8050 stop of the, of the transatlantic because of British pressure. And this has a lot of, of, consequences, but this is the story from above, and I wanted to tell another story. And I wanted to talk about the momentum, that's the second critic, you're really, yes, you're, I mean, the question is also linked to the Spanish-American um, uh, cases, why only 1870s, why not before, and this is, yeah, what also one of the criticisms of Shaloub and I cannot give you any satisfactory answer to it because, of course, Spanish America also had fountains. <laughs> and the same, I mean, not the very same thing happened, but similar things. As I wanted to say, it's not only fountains, but public spaces, so markets would be included. And in the, my idea was publicness in itself makes this momentum. This could, in, we cannot say in, in every city, so this was also a question, I, I would say, I didn't study other cities, but I would say this happened in all of them, but then why not everywhere at the same time, so why did it, I, these, that it um, finished much before in Spanish America, ah, um, well, it's a different historical context, um, it's external pressure, it's independence, 
um, wars in Brazil, the independence, um, yeah, was more or less at the same time, but it happened in a very different manner. Mm -hmm. So these are the standard reasons. I have no better reasons with my momentum. I only wanted to apply the momentum because I was asked to apply the momentum and I see it's not very convincing. And my biggest problem is in fact that I go until the police and then I have no link to the, to the lawsuits. I just, don't know how to link these things. Uh, it's that's what I said. It's just, yeah, somehow arresting a person does not need that he goes to court to say, I am in fact a free man. So first question. Second, why fountains of my, I, um, and other regions in Brazil? Um, yeah, I think um, this happened a little bit everywhere. It was more important in the capital because it had a um, model um, character so, and it had the courts, of course, access to court you don't have in the countryside, you don't have in smaller cities as well as that. This is a first, uh, the, how do you call it, the, the, um, a, pi a, pi a pioneer situation. So I think that's, that's the difference from Rio to other places, but in general, I would say my argument was that it happens everywhere, but then there's the question, why not, why at this time? And I have no good answer to, to the chronology. Um, yes, uh, slaveholders. Um, as I said in my uh, presentation, slaveholders were the first to go to court. So they started in the uh, 1870s, uh, 18th century in Brazil, they started to go to court. But the slaves got the possibility of um, defending their cases. And um, this was how they entered the courtroom, not because they wanted to go there, but because the slave holder said, this person in general, it was because they were unthankful, unthankful, undankbar. So they freed them. And then the freed slave was still obliged to be a nice person. And when this freed slave, former slave, did not behave in the way the former um, owner wanted him to behave, he could go to court and say, I want him back as my slave because he did not fulfill his um, obligation of, of being a nice person. So the, the, the crime is unthankfulness. This is how it's described. Um, then the slave said, yes, but so, and they defended their cases. I'm not really sure what you said about, um, but I, I, I'm nearly, I, I think I even read that what you said that at the end of, shortly before the abolition, that the slaveholders went to court to free themselves of, of the slaves. I, I have somehow the idea, but I'm, I'm not really sh uh, sure if I read it from other countries or if I just, so it, I did not really take note of it, but, um, probably Brazilian slave owners were also intelligent to get rid of economic burdens. Um, Haiti is a very interesting thing. Um, I, I thought a lot about Haiti, why people did not speak about Haiti in Brazil. This is a very strange thing. So there are traces of it in the, um, in the, when they made the constitution, they had, in fact, two, um, constitutional how do you call them, assemblies. The first one um, was different from the second. The second was more the, the, the emperor who did then something like... But it, at the first one, they discussed a lot um, if to give the citizenship to black people or not, to the freed, uh, free people, black people. And they argued, um, dissimulated with Haiti. So they said, we have the... Well, this is a very strong interpretation. We have to give the free black people citizenship. If not, they will ally with the enslaved and we will have a second Haiti. But you, this is not what they say in the protocols. This is a lot of putting our into the historian's interpretation into it. In general, I think they silence Haiti. So their idea is more, we don't talk about it and then it won't happen. This, you, I think you can trace this to quite a, a strong and um, enslaved people knew it. I, there is one thing that I, as a black person, he was not enslaved, had an, like an amulet um, with the picture of the Saline uh, at his mm -hmm. breast. So 
um, yes, I knew. And this very early, I, I, I don't know, I, in the very early, I said after the, after the saline being of importance. So they knew that we have no traces. Um, and white people had a politics of not, of silencing. So of not talking about Haiti. In Brazil. In Brazil. I, I, I'm so. Also because they want to continue with slavery. I think if you are already near to abolish, then you can, this is a good argument, say, okay, we won't, don't want to repeat Haiti. But in a book, right? Didn't you say that? Joaquin Nabucco? Is that what you were citing before? Uh, I, no, uh, but I was citing, I was citing Troyot. Mm. Um, Jean Rolf, what's his name? Um, about silence, his book is written, Silencing. Silencing something, I don't know what. Silencing Haiti, something like that. But I can't give you the exact title. It's a very good um, book, and but it's about Haiti and Europe, or a more general aspect. Um, but you can see this very clearly in Brazil, that they really silence Haiti very... I mean, they don't say we silence it, but... In very, very many um, instances, you would say, well, it's nothing, I don't know, 1808. How can we not talk if the police, what's this, to give them a mandate and not say, please look that we don't have a Haiti here or something like that. But they say, please, um, let's not have a French Revolution here because French Revolution, that's chaos and that's bad. So I think this is very interesting and yeah.